It is great to see you this morning, and I'm, I'm really happy that it worked out to where I got to preach on this passage this morning. Uh, I'm, I wasn't expecting uh, that I was going to get to preach on the beginning of James chapter 2, but it turned out that way, and I'm glad that it did because I really enjoy this passage, and uh, I'm really excited about, you know, kind of what, what God's been teaching me through it and to share that with you all as well. And we, we humans, we like to have favorites, don't we? I mean, we've got all kinds of them. We've got favorite restaurant, your favorite ice cream flavor, your favorite teams, you know, your favorite movie, vacation spot, band, favorite chair to sit in in the living room or in the sanctuary. And we, we love to talk about our favorites. We love to uh, think about them, to sit and, and discover new ones. And most of them are benign and harmless. But, however, our penchant for preference carries over into our sinful side as well. And then we start to make lists of favorites that are not so benign. Rather than making preferences among inanimate objects, we start making preferences among people in our lives. Maybe we end up with a favorite child or grandchild or favorite neighbor, or sibling, or our preferred educational background, and, and hairstyles, and spiritual pedigrees that we like with, to have of the people that we hang out with. And before you know it, we, we have our preferred skin colors, and ethnicities, and accents. And this causes all kinds of problems in the world, from rudeness, to racism, to genocide. One of the areas that we like to play favorites is money. Who do you think are business owners' favorite customers? I, my favorite customer. Translation, hey, the one who spends the most money here. And, and what do you think being the favorite customer gets you? Preferential treatment, of course. You know, better service, more perks, more attention. And this mentality doesn't just magically disappear in the church, in church life either. Many people could tell stories about pastors' favorite members who just so happened to have the ear of the pastor and just so happened to be someone who gave a lot of money. Church history has its fair share of financial prejudice, including selling seats in church. And, and so those who couldn't afford to rent or lease the best seats would have to sit in one of the unreserved spots. That's a real thing. It was a real thing. Maybe not here. But when we think of prejudice, we tend to attribute it to hatred and ignorance. And surely those can be present. But I will contend this morning that the root of prejudice is pride. And that's also your first blanks of, in the notes this morning, if you're following along with your notes. The root of prejudice is pride. And I say that because of what James teaches us in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Which says, My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes, clothes comes in also, if you look in favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, yeah, s -s sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, stand over there, or, or, or sit on the floor by my footstool, haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Yet you have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Don't they blaspheme the name, the good name that was invoked over you? Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you are a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for all the other passages of Scripture that you have provided in your word to support it and strengthen it and clarify it. And we pray that we would be listening this morning. Lord, you have made a point in Scripture and we need to get it. And I pray that we would. And that you would show us exactly what that means and what to do with it. So let our hearts and our minds be open, please, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as we started this passage, it would be good to remember the end of chapter 1, which I know it's been a few weeks. But when we finished chapter 1 of James, you remember how James pointed out that pure and undefiled religion is to help those who can't help themselves and to keep ourselves unstained from the world. And then James goes on to discuss a big, bright, nasty stain on the face of some of the Christians at the time. It's as if James is saying, and about being unstained by the world, let's talk about that egg on your face. And the stain that he brings up is favoritism. So go back to verse 1. He says, Do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And so at the very beginning, James makes it clear that favoritism is not compatible with faith in Jesus. As we hold on to Christ, holding on to prejudice and holding on to Jesus don't go together. And God made th this clear to Peter, right? When he showed him that, that vision of the sheet coming down out of the heavens and, and it had all kinds of animals on it. And God told Peter, hey, eat. And Peter's like, no, God, I can't eat this food. This is unclean. And God says, don't call unclean what I have made clean. And at the time, Peter probably didn't completely understand what God was trying to get across to him, but eventually he got the point. And in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, this is what Peter, he said to them, Peter, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And in verses 34 and 35, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. See, there's an incompatibility of Christianity and prejudice based on external appearance and, and these arbitrary worldly divisions. And it's always been that way with God. It's not like it just started here. No, we think about when Samuel was going to find the next king of Israel and he thought from the family of Jesse and he was sure it was going to be Eliab who looked the part. But God said in 1 Samuel 16, 7, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God does not see as man sees since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And this makes us think of Christ himself, who in that great messianic vision in Isaiah 53 that, that Toby was just reading about when we did communion. And Isaiah 53 verse 2 speaks of Christ, the Messiah himself, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should, would look at him nor in appearance that we would take pleasure in Him. That's about Jesus. And reading these verses in James brings to mind, you, you'll see a very stark connection between James 2, 1 through 13 and Leviticus 19. Verses 15 through 18 say, You shall not do injustice in judgment. You shall not show partiality to the poor nor give preference to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. 
You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you are not to jeopardize the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may certainly rebuke your neighbor, but you are not to incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor hold any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see, this idea of giving people of different economic status equal treatment is not something that was new in the New Testament. This is the way it's always been with God. If you need more proof, look at Proverbs 28, 21 to show partiality is not good. Because for a piece of bread, a man will do wrong. In 22, 2, the rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is maker of them all. Malachi 2, 9, so I also have made you despised and of low reputation in the view of all the people since you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in the instruction. Has God made his point? I think he has. Partiality and Christianity don't fit together. And James explains why with an illustration. In verses 2 through 4, he says, For if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes also comes in. If you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor person, stand over there, or sit here by my feet, haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, whether James made up this scenario or was talking about something, an event that he knew about that happened, <laughs> we don't know for sure. But it doesn't really matter either way because it represented a problem that was very real in this early church. And I believe it represents a problem that is still very real today. In fact, J.A. Motyer put it really well when he said, even if such blatant inequality is now a thing of the past, and I think that's a big if anyway, but even if it's a thing of the past, it is by no means unusual for a person to have a voice in church affairs related not to his wisdom, but to his wealth. In the same way, it is common for well-heeled congregations to assume that they ought to have and to get the most gifted pastors, while fellowships in less promising or attractive areas cannot expect more than the average. Money still does the talking far too loudly in Christian circles, and where and when it does, the glory of Christ departs. See, intellectually, we probably understand that, that favoritism based on things like socioeconomic status and external appearance is wrong. But contextually, we are going to have a hard time seeing it because it's such a strong part of our culture. You know, when you study history, you realize how people, including Christians, tended to be a product of the time that they lived in. You know, and, and so we end up with blind spots because something is just so common, just so accepted around us. That's why we can have people like Jonathan Edwards who, who owned slaves or Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer who despised Jewish people or John Calvin who believed that it was appropriate to execute heretics. People that many consider historical Christian heroes with blind spots. And in our time, it could be many things. Could be divorce, could be abortion, could be biblical marriage. And for sure, one is favoritism. You see, when we're bombarded with favoritism, we, we develop a callousness, a desensitization to it. And, and it's all around us. Politics is almost all about favoritism today. You know, who's got the money? Whoever's got the money has the favors. Business is riddled with favoritism, and you know what? So are churches. We have to think, where are we tempted to show favoritism? And it, it may or may, may, might not be about money. You know, someone in a super nice suit could roll up in a European supercar and not get any special treatment from us. I don't know. It hasn't happened yet. So I don't know. But what, what, what if it's not even specifically about money, but about fame? What about a celebrity? Think about your favorite actor. What kind of attention would you give to them if they happened to walk in the service today? 
You know, and what if it's not even about big celebrity, but just a local one? Or what if it's not even about fame, but just someone who could benefit us, right? Like a roofer. We need a roof. We're going to need a roof on that other building, right? So would we be tempted to gawk over a well-known roofer who starts attending our church? Or what if the, the rich or the famous powerful person walks in right behind the poor stinky one? What are we going to do then? Are we going to try to keep them away from each other? Oh, stall. Stall him for a minute. We're going to try to sit them at opposite corners of the sanctuary? Or, or what if it's not even a poor smelly person, but someone who comes in with swastika tattoos or a Planned Parenthood hat or something? Something else about them that just irks you. What will we do when our preferences are put to the test? Is it wrong if a rich, famous, or powerful person comes in and you go out of your way to, to greet them and to give them attention, to show them love and ask them, show genuine interest in their life and ask them questions, start conversations, make sure they're well taken care of? Absolutely not. In fact, please do that. But, would you show the same treatment to the homeless one who comes in with the shopping cart? That's the real question. What about the woman who comes in and looks like a prostitute? Or the kid who comes in and looks like he's in a gang? You see, there is nothing wrong with showing love to the rich or the famous. What is wrong is withholding Love from the poor and the outcast and those different than us. Of course, our Sunday service is not the only thing that should be free of favoritism. It's our whole life. Who do we invite over for dinner into our homes, out for activities? And that's not really the best question to ask because it's not like we should start feeling guilty because we invite people into our life. But the question we really have to focus on is are there people that we are intentionally leaving out of our life due to a sinful attitude of favoritism? Are we excited when we see people come through the doors of this church, when we see people come into our homes, when, we, when people come with us to do things, to start a relationship with us? We should be excited about those things. And if we're not, well, that's a, a different problem that needs to be addressed. If we don't want those things. But are we more excited about the prospect of some relationships than others? And I have to admit it. Sometimes, I, yeah, that has, I'm sure that's true. I might be more excited if a local news anchor visited than a local beggar. The house across the street and one over from us sold recently. And, you know, when, when you know you're getting new neighbors, you know how it is. You know, you go through the, the things in your mind of the, the people that you hope move in, the preferred candidates, and so you're thinking to yourselves, oh, you know, I, I hope they have young kids, or I hope they're Christians, or oh, it'd be cool if they had a boat, you know. And, uh, and, and you also go through your list of the people who you don't prefer to move in, and you're like, oh, well, what, what, what if they're Muslim or Hindu or Wiccan or something or... or what if it's a, a gay couple, or what if, uh, oh, no, what if they're from California? <laughs> you know? But in the end, it was a woman retired from teaching, from Arizona. Yeah, you know, in the middle of the road, nothing too exciting. Oh, retired teacher from Arizona, yay! But you know what? She had dinner at her house last week. And she needs the love of God just like anybody else. Just like any other kind of person that could have moved into that home. See, favoritism, it has no place in the heart of a Christian. It's the opposite of the gospel. And James 
tells us what we're really doing when we show it. He says that we've become judges with evil thoughts. So in other words, we've taken ourselves off the throne. We've taken Christ off the throne and put ourselves on it, all in service to our own evil thinking. And you think, well, why are these thoughts of partiality so wrong? It's because it's self-serving. It's self-serving. I mean, think about it. Like, the only reason we would ever show partiality to certain groups of people is to serve ourselves. Because as we've seen, God made it abundantly clear that it doesn't serve Him. And I think the root of these self-serving thoughts is pride. I do. Let's look at verses 5 through 7 again. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Yet you have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Don't they blaspheme the good name that was invoked over you? Now, in chapter 1 of James, we already discussed the paradox of the economically poor being spiritually advantaged and vice versa. So I'm not going to linger on verse 5, except to remind us also of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. He said, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the, spies, the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And then James goes on to describe, point out a, something that was happening among these Christians that was really illogical. They were giving preferential treatment to the very people who were making their life difficult. You're like, how does it make sense to give preferential treatment to the rich when they were the ones who were making it hard to live out your faith? To which one might say, well, yeah, but, you know, they're also the ones who could make it easier for us to live out our faith. To which the Bible would say, but God chose these people to expand his kingdom. The poor, the lowly. And we would be like, well, yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. But then I, the Bible has an even deeper criticism of this attitude, I think, that says to us, hey, besides this, what gives you the right to treat them differently? What is it inside of us that causes us to judge people based on their appearance? And the answer is pride. And you might say, well, wait a second. How is it pride? Like, I understand, okay, maybe it's wrong, but I don't understand how it's pride. Well, think about it. When, when we show partiality based on external appearances, we've put ourselves on a throne that only Jesus should be on as the judge of who deserves our love and attention. We've made ourselves the one who determines a person's value instead of Christ. Just like pride overcame Adam and Eve to the point where they would say, uh, actually, we'll be the ones to determine which fruit should and should not be eaten, thank you. We let pride overcome us to the point where we say, well, you know, we'll be the judge of who deserves our love and attention. Thank you very much. That's an incredibly prideful position to be in. And Sam Alberry put it this way. James' point is a simple one. Favoritism is profoundly unchristian. It says, in effect, that someone who is worth more to the world is worth more to the church. And correspondingly, that someone who is worth less to the world is worth less to the church. That's true. And it's prideful. And the excuses we make we should prefer powerful, influential, rich people are based on, uh, on us, a failure to see things the way that God sees them, right? Because we're like, we're so prideful that we think we need to give God a helping hand by getting certain kinds of people on his team because he's fallen behind with all these lowly ones. And I, and I, had, I had to share it. It was too good. I just, I, this is a long quote, but I had to share it from Sam Alberry as well. He said, James' words are a warning that we are not to think that reaching the rich and powerful with the gospel is more strategic than reaching the poor. 
It's easy for Christians to find themselves thinking that if only we could get a sports star or celebrity or high-profile leader converted, then it would be a great coup for the gospel. Such people, by, by virtue of their position, are deemed to be more strategically valuable than others. And so resources are apportioned accordingly. They are reckoned to be the key to reaching society as a whole. And so if a professional footballer comes into the church at the same time as a tramp, it's the footballer that becomes the focus of attention. The privileged need reaching because they are lost, not because they matter more than anyone else. Building a gospel strategy around key people in society contradicts the very insight that James is drawing to our attention. God's strategy, by and large, is to use the weak things of the world to achieve His purposes. Well, that really turns our thinking around. Because we tell ourselves, oh man, if we could just get Christians into these positions, or if we could just get the people in these positions to become Christians, think about what great gospel work could happen. But church, have we forgot what the gospel is? We don't need people in strategic positions for Christ's sinless life and birth and death and resurrection to be powerful. It is powerful. We don't need to think about what great gospel work could happen if, if presidents and CEOs would come to Christ. What is that saying to the lowly in the world? Oh man, it would be cool if you came to Jesus, but think about what this guy could do if he became a Christian. God can use the janitor for more kingdom work than the governor. We need to believe that. We need to remember that. We need to remember what great gospel work happens when we take it to the poor. The gospel spread greatly among poor people in the New Testament and continues to do so to this day. And we may not see it as much in our historically affluent Christianized society, but the gospel is still growing. The church all over the world and mainly in poor places among poor people. And we have no right to lower or to enhance the value of anyone's soul. James says, Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You see, James makes it very clear that this kind of partiality is sin. And he brings us back to what we're supposed to do instead, which is to love our neighbor as ourself. Which I think helps prevent an overcorrection that we are, have a tendency to go towards. You see, it's natural for us to favor people like ourselves. That's natural for everybody. But another natural tendency that we have as humans is to overcorrect whenever we discover a sin that we're guilty of. And so in the case of favoritism, we naturally favor people like us. And when we realize we've done that, we tend to overcorrect and then start favoring people unlike us. And it's like we're trying to balance out the scales. Right? We're like, well, i, I got to show more favoritism over here now because of the favoritism I showed over here. But that's still favoritism. You see, the correct response is not opposite favoritism. The correct response is no favoritism. Many times we end up trying to excuse ourselves of our favoritism, claiming that, well, the partiality that I show is good partiality. But James makes it clear that as far as things like, like money and status and notoriety and power and external appearances, skin color. There's no good partiality. Don't treat a rich person like a poor person or a poor person like a rich person. Treat a person made in the image of God like a person made in the image of God. Because that's what they are. You see, the poor people that Jesus loved, which are many, are infinitely thankful that He did not show partiality against them. And people like Matthew and Zacchaeus are infinitely thankful that Jesus did not show partiality against them. 
So if a celebrity is going to come to Christ, then they can come to Christ being treated just like everyone else. And if a pimp is going to come to Christ, then they can come to Christ being treated just like everyone else. Now, I need to clarify that I say that with the assumption that we're treating people the right way. Because not showing favoritism certainly isn't an excuse to treat everyone poorly. We don't get to say, oh, we don't show favorites around here. They all get the same bad service. Now, I prefer that if that rich or famous or powerful person walks into Riviera Baptist Church, that they feel like they got the VIP treatment. And then they're like, oh man, these people, they know who I am. And then they turn around and they see the poor person walk in and get the same treatment. And they're like, oh, well, I guess they just do this with everybody. See, Satan wants us to show partiality. He wants us to accept it as, you know, just the, the respectable sin of our time. But James doesn't have, he doesn't want any of that. So he says, For whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you're a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are judged by the law of freedom. So this is where I believe we, we can see James's great insight into sinful human minds and hearts. Because he knows that there's going to be some who are like, come on, James. Like, you're making a big deal out of nothing. Like, sure, we show some preferential treatment to certain people sometimes, but it is not nearly as bad as you're making it out to be. And, and th like, think about all the bad things that we don't do, okay? As if it's a good argument that when your teenager comes home with a smashed car door because they were doing donuts in the parking lot and slid into a pole, and then they say, but dad, mom, like, uh, look at all the spots that I didn't hit. Look, these doors over here are just fine. Or the, or the murderer who's like, hey, hold on, guys, before you convict me here, I haven't stolen anything. And look at all the people that I haven't murdered. You guys are all alive. Now, James makes it very, very clear that this kind of prejudice is sinful. It's not something to just be frowned upon. It's something to be rebuked and repented of. And I love the way that he finishes this thought with verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, the first sentence of that verse brings to mind what Jesus had taught about forgiveness and mercy. And the Bible makes it very clear that forgiven people are forgiving people. And in the same vein, mercied people are merciful people. So those of, who have walked, stepped into the mercy and forgiveness of God through Christ are going to extend that to others. And if we don't, then we really need to evaluate whether we know him at all. But the way James finishes this, the last sentence, specifically the word that's translated as triumph, brings this picture of like mercy standing over judgment in victory. Like mercy and judgment got into a brawl and mercy kicked judgment's butt and is now standing over it with its foot on judgment's neck, hoisting its fist into the air. Now, we know that God's judgment is just. So we're not trying to, to paint God's just judgment like it's a, a negative thing, like it's an evil thing. It's just. It's totally fine, righteous, good for God to send us all to hell and condemn us all for eternity. But this picture of mercy triumphing over judgment brings us back to the gospel where we remember that Christ, mercy came as Jesus Christ, to triumph over our sin and give us eternal life instead of the death that we deserved. And so how could we, who have been saved from what we deserved, then go and treat others like they don't deserve our time and our attention and our mercy? And I have to admit, it is easy to come up with ways to not show love to people. It's so easy. Look at that rich snob. He probably spends more money on clothes than we do on rent. 
Look at that hobo. I mean, look at him. Look at the way he's stumbling. He probably spends more money on booze and drugs than we do on food. Look at that kid. They're, they probably spend more time playing video games than we do working. And you know what? Even if all the assumptions I could ever make about people were true, even if that rich person is the worst, even if that homeless druggie wants to stay that way forever, even if that lazy bum never gets up and lifts a finger to help society, without Christ, they should be pitied. My heart should still break for them regardless of their life choices. Because judgment is coming. But mercy triumphs. And that's the reality of this whole favoritism thing. It's not about who we think deserves our time or attention or the best seat in our sanctuary or at our dinner table. It's about mercy on those who don't deserve it, which is everyone, which was us. And so let's kill the pride of prejudice and usher in instead the majesty of mercy. God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. You are so amazing. God, even in the pictures that we probably come up with in our minds about what Jesus was like or what he looked like, <laughs> Scripture makes it clear that as far as external appearance went, he was nothing special. Yet he was the Creator. He is our Messiah, our Savior. God, just help us to just bask in the awe and wonder of Christ. Help us to just sit here humbly on our faces thinking about the way that you have worked in this world and the, the plans that you have made. God, may Riviera Baptist Church not be a church that shows partiality, favoritism, prejudice. God, help us to find those areas in our life where maybe we are shutting someone out of our life. Maybe there's someone that you want to bring to our hearts and to our mind this morning that we know that we are shutting out of our life because of this sinful attitude. And I pray that there would be great repentance this morning if there's anything like that in our lives. And Lord, help us not to think of ourselves as anything special. And help us not to view anyone else as any more or less valuable. Help us to have your eyes for this world. Your eyes for how you've chosen to spread your kingdom. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I wanted to end today uh, by sharing a story with you guys. And um, I can't really say whether or not it's a true story. Don't know for sure. <laughs> 
but it's truly believable. <laughs> so, uh, Pastor Jeremiah Stepik transformed himself into a homeless person and went to the 10,000 member church that he was to be introduced as the head pastor at that morning. He walked around his soon-to-be church for 30 minutes while it was filling with people for service. Only three people out of the seven to 10,000 people said hello to him. He asked people for change to buy food. No one in the church gave him change. He went into the sanctuary to sit down in the front of the church and was asked by the ushers if he would please sit in the back. He greeted people to be greeted back with stares and dirty looks, with people looking down on him and judging him. As he sat in the back of the church, he listened to the church announcements and such. When all that was done, the elders went up and were excited to introduce the new pastor of the church to the congregation. We would like to introduce to you Pastor Jeremiah Stepik. The congregation looked around, clapping with joy and anticipation. The homeless man sitting in the back stood up and started walking down the aisle. The clapping stopped with all eyes on him. He walked up the altar and took the microphone from the elders who were in on this and paused for a moment. Then he recited Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. After he recited this, he looked towards the congregation and told them all what he experienced that morning. Many began to cry and many heads were bowed in shame. And then he said, Today I see a gathering of people, not a church of Jesus Christ. The world has enough people, but not enough disciples. When will you decide to become disciples? And he then dismissed service. I thought about dressing up as a homeless person this morning, but be a little harder to blend in than it would in a 10,000 member congregation. <laughs> but I wanted to end by sharing that story, whether real or not. It's realistic. And um, that passage of Scripture still proves a very good connection to what we've looked at this morning. And so... Lord, help us. Thank you, Jesus. We just thank you. We pray that we would not just be a group of people but that we would be a group of disciples. Amen. Thanks for coming. You're dismissed.